morning, everybody, and welcome to New Life. Um, glad you're here. Let's go ahead and we'll open with a word of prayer. Father God in heaven, Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you, Lord, for uh, a place that we can come and worship you, and that we can uh, lift our voices and praise to you, Lord, give you the glory that you so deserve. Pray, God, that you'll be with this service, that uh, you'll open our hearts and our minds to uh, the message today, God. Pray that you would bless the pastor as he brings your word to us. So, Lord, we just pray that the that our voices would be lifted to you and it would just make a joyful noise and you'd, uh, you'd be blessed by our worship. So we thank you and praise you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
morning, New Life. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Did, I, did I mute or unmute? You're fine. Okay, I'm good. All right. <laughs> I always reach down and I flip the switch. I, I push the button, but I'm always wondering, did I just, did I do it right or do it wrong? Wayne, help me. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Um, I believe this is going to be our, our last in, in our series of questions that Jesus asked. And, and so I kind of... I'm kind of ending on a question of understanding, a question of faith, almost a little bit of a frustration in, in Jesus. You know, he's asking the question, do you not yet understand? Have, have, you, have you gotten it yet? Have you, have, you ever, have you ever tried to get something through to your kids? <laughs> you notice I said try? <laughs> it's amazing how sometimes it, you wonder, is, it, is anything getting in there? Is anything getting through there? Uh, you know, I, I remember um, my son, uh, when, he was, when he was real little, I mean, he was probably, I think he was about four or five. Um, when, he was, when he was really little, when he first started, when he first started uh, walking and, and running and that kind of thing, um, we, we, did, we, we would wrestle and uh, you know, tussle about it. That's what, that's what guys and, and their sons do, right? Uh, we had this game where we had this long house where we had a living room up front, we had a narrow hallway, and then we had a, like, a, like a family room in the back, and it was just one big long stretch. And what, he, what we would do is I would get on the one end, and he would get on the other end, and he would take off running as fast as he could, straight at me, and it was my job to somehow absorb the momentum and make it fun for him while also keeping him safe. So what I would do is I would sit on the I would sit on the ground, and I, I'd have you know one or two, you know, maybe my legs crossed, maybe and we wanted to stick it off to the side or whatever. And as he would run towards me, I would grab him and I would fall down onto my back. I'm not going to demonstrate it because I'm not going to help you <laughs> up. But I'd fall down onto my back and he'd fly, and then I would even take him all the way to the point where his head would almost touch this, the floor, and then I'd bring him back and, and put him back down, and he'd run back to the other side of the room and go and do it again. Right? Guys, dads, you know what I'm talking about, that same kind of thing? Well, as he got older and as he got bigger, it got, more, it got harder and harder on me, right? Now I'm taking on the full force of a six, seven-year-old running at me full speed. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'd get stuck there and finally bring him back, that kind of thing. Well, I remember one day, he was trying to convince his sister, who's two years older than him, but she's never been the most adventurous one, and she didn't like the rough and tumble the same way that Logan did, but she decided she wanted to try it. And I'm sitting here going, I don't think so. She's two years older, right? I mean, she's like nine. She's bigger, and I'm like... I'm not sure my body can handle it. And I was about, I was about to say, uh, no, no, no. But then I heard my son tell my daughter, little, little five, six-year-old six son, tell Lila, hey, don't worry about it, Lila. Daddy always catches you. I guarantee it. <laughs> well, now i got to do it, right? <laughs> like, that, I'm, I'm full on committed, right? He plays such faith in me. And where did that faith come from? It came from his experience. It came from, I had never dropped him. I had never, I had never failed him to that point. And so he, he, had, he had it in his mind. He said, Daddy always catches you. I guarantee it. Yeah. Guys, does God always catch us? Yes. Yes. Do we not yet understand that? What more is it going to take? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. We're, we're, we're going to read Mark. Matthew or Mark? Mark. Mark. Mark chapter 8. Yes. Matthew chapter 8 would be a very different sermon. Than I, <laughs> I don't even know what Matthew chapter 8 says. Let's, let's look at Mark chapter 8. Do me a favor. Would you stand with me as we read God's word together? We're going to start in verse, uh, in verse 11. No, we're going to start in verse 14. It says there, uh, but the disciples had forgotten to bring any food. A little background, uh, they, had, they had gotten into a boat, they had made a, made a, 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 a journey. Um, the Pharisees said some, said some things that, you know, Jesus was like, you know, I'm not even going to give this generation a sign. As a matter of fact, let's get back in the boat, right? So they get back in the boat, and they, the disciples, um, they, they had only one loaf of bread with them in the boat. As they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, Watch out, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. At this, they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. 
Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, Why are you arguing about having no bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all? When I fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread, how many baskets of leftovers did you pick up afterward? Twelve, they said. And when I fed the 4,000 with seven loaves, how many large baskets of leftovers did you pick up? Seven, they said. Don't you understand yet? He asked them. Don't you understand yet? Would you bow with me forward? Please? Amen. Dear Lord, as we're gathered here this morning, as, we, as we're looking at this, this story, at, at, at the words, Lord, as we even see some of the, some of the frustration, Lord, I, I know that we can be a people, a, a very frustrating people. Lord, we can be hard to convince. We can be hard-headed, hard-hearted. Lord, I pray that we would be open to your word here this morning. That we would be open to the message that you have to give to us. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We see here, we see Jesus, he has several questions for them. First of all, so, so just to give you a little, little bit more context, they had just come from feeding the 4,000. They got into a boat, they went across the sea, they got over to the other side, and the Pharisees, the, the Pharisees uh, kind of corner him, and they want to they argue with him, and, and they, they, they demand him to show a miraculous sign. And he says, he says, you know what, why is this generation always looking for a sign? Basically, he said, I'm not your, I'm not your trained monkey. <laughs> I'm not going to continue performing for you. He says, you will be given no sign. As a matter of fact, he, gets, he tells the disciples, all right, back in the boat. Right? Seems, it seems like the only peace he got from the crowds of people and the Pharisees and all of the, all of the demands, the only peace he got was out on the boat. So he said, everybody back on the boat. They get back on the boat and they head back out into, into the water. And the, ar the argument arises among the disciples because they only have one loaf of bread with them. I can, I, I can only imagine how this how this went. Well, okay, so where's where's our food? Uh, I thought you had it. No, no, you had it. Where, where is it? So, well, all I've got is one little loaf of bread. And guys, understand when, when the Bible, when the scripture talks about a loaf of bread, I want, you to I want you to understand they're not talking about Wonder Bread. They're not talking about Sara Lee. We're not, we're not talking about a loaf of bread, right? You know, because otherwise that, would make, that wouldn't make sense with the rest of the story, right? How many loaves and fishes? There was five loaves. <laughs> For, it was a small boy's lunch. Have you ever seen a small boy eat five loaves of bread if they were the full? <laughs> would that be the, the, the standard lunch you would send with your 12-year-old? <laughs> you know, here you go. Here's five loaves of bread, honey, and, and here's three gallons of milk to wash it down. Right? No, it wasn't that. We're talking, we're, we're talking more like little biscuits, right? More like little personal kind of kind of muffin even size, right? And so the disciples are saying, well, we only have one loaf of bread here. And they start arguing, why didn't you bring more? I don't know. Why didn't you bring more? Remember, they're just coming from the feeding of the 4,000. They had some leftovers, didn't they? <laughs> right? Jesus just asked them, how many baskets of leftovers? Seven. And one of them was probably like, why didn't you grab one of the baskets? He was like, I don't know. I left it. I thought it would, I thought it would be a good donation. I left it for the, the crowd. You know, I thought I was doing a good thing. He's like, yeah, well, what are we going to eat? Oh, they're arguing. They're arguing. You know, you know, you know it was like that, right? You know, the, the scripture doesn't record all of it, but you know the disciples. We've seen how boneheaded they can be in other places. You know it was that kind of an argument. And Jesus overhears all this. He knows what's going on. He says, why are you guys arguing about bread? Think about this for a moment. Why are you arguing about whether or not we have enough food? Don't you get it yet? He, makes, he asks them his first question. He says, do you understand? Don't you understand even yet? Even yet, don't you understand? That it was a question of their experience. He said, listen, after all you've experienced, you're still going to argue over something so small? After all that you've seen, and, and what did they see? They had seen miracles. They, here, just a, a couple chapters before this, they saw Jesus walk on water. Would that be an experience you would write home about? Something to tell tell a story about? They'd seen those kind of miracles. They'd seen demons cast out. They'd seen him heal people of blindness and leprosy and, and shriveled hands and deformities. They'd seen, they'd seen all of this happen. They had just seen him feed 4,000 people with only seven little loaves of bread. Can, can he not handle 12 with one? <laughs> right? 
Jesus is asking them, hasn't your experience meant anything to you? Why are we still having this conversation? Why do you not yet understand who I am? He's demonstrated power over the physical world. He's demonstrated power over diseases. He's demonstrated power over the, the physical limitations that we think that we have. And Jesus is still wondering, what more is it going to take? How can you still not understand this? He goes on to ask him another question. He says, are your hearts too hard to take it in? He said, that, that's a question of openness, right? He says, are your hearts too hard to take it in, right? We, we, we allow things to harden our hearts, don't we? We allow bad experiences. We allow, uh, uh, we allow doubts and, and worries and fears. We allow our hearts to be hardened. Like in, in today's world, I, I think I'm, I was talking to Ron uh, yesterday. Um, we were talking about the news of the day. You know, we had a long, a long drive, and so we talked about everything. And, and, um, and one of the things I told him, I said, my biggest, my biggest problem right now is I don't feel like I can trust anything. You know what I'm talking about? I don't feel like I can trust what I'm, what I'm told. You know, somebody says, oh, I saw this article, and I'm like, okay, whatever. I don't, I don't know who wrote it. I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know. I, I, I don't feel like I can trust the news. I don't, I don't necessarily even feel like I can trust, you know, certain people when they come and tell me, well, this is this, 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 this. I'm like, I'm not sure I believe you. Right? And that's, unfortunately, my heart has become a little hardened to those kind of things. I'm not, I, you know, for fear of being too gullible and being deceived, which I believe is happening all the time in our world today, I've hardened my heart towards those things. So, the, the, you know, the, the, the fake news, the, the intellectual pressure. Now, I've seen people that, that, that will, they won't open up their heart to the things of Scripture because there's smart people around them have told them not to believe that, that, that faith in God is some kind of crutch. I've known people that live in the intellectual world that can't, that can't accept a creator, God. Because the people around them would, would ridicule them and, and, and cast them out, basically. Right? So they've hardened their heart. They, 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 won't, they, they won't leave it open for the things of God. I, I've seen people have selfish pride. I've seen people, I witnessed to a person one time who had been a Mormon their entire life. And, and I sat down with them. They came to visit with me. And I said, sure, come on in. And, and oh, and boy, he regretted that. I, I guarantee you that. He didn't know what he was in for. <laughs> right? But he came in to, to sit, sit with me. And I said, I said hey, we can... We can look at whatever scripture you want. I have two rules. I said, number one, it needs to be out of the Bible, not the Book of Mormon or Pearl of Great Price or any of the other scriptures that you recognize that I don't. I said, it has to come out of the Bible. And I said, number two, we have to look at it in context. We're going to look at the verses before it and the verses after it to make sure we're getting a proper interpretation. We sat there for two and a half hours. And it, at the end of it, he sat there ashen, white face, and he said, I can't believe this. I said, what? He said, I've been lied to my whole life. The Jesus that I believe in is not the Jesus of the Bible. And I said, that's why I invited you in. I said, because you, you came to my doorstep believing you were a Christian. I needed you to understand you're not. Because you believe in a totally different Jesus. And I said, I said, would you like to make that decision today? And he looked at me in his face went from ash and white to stern. And he said, nope, I can't do that. And I said, why? He said, I refuse to believe I've lived in a lie. And I can't turn my back on it. I said, even though I can show it to you, he said, I can't do it. He couldn't accept the idea that he had been wrong. His selfish pride kept him from opening his heart to the things of God. And I, I dare say, I, I, I never spoke to that young man again, but I dare say, if he hasn't changed his heart, if he hasn't broken it down, he is still bound for hell today. How many of us are letting our selfish pride block us and harden our hearts from the things of God? We see that maybe we just have cynicism or negativity. You know, I, how many of you guys are a glass half full kind of person? Oh, only four or five of us? How many of us are glass half empty kind of person? That's a few people that are willing to admit it, right? How many of us are, I don't have a glass, there's nothing in the whole world that's all cold or hopeless? Well, it's me. Well, it's me. Some of us are sitting there going, you got a glass of water? Oh, 
<laughs> All I got was sand. <laughs> some of you know, some of us are our, our outlook. We're, we're naturally cynical. We're naturally a negative person. And so when, when we hear the gospel, the good news, hey, Jesus loves you and wants wants to take you to heaven, wants to purchase your eternity, we naturally think, eh, that's too good to be true. That's a fairy tale. No. Uh, mm. Right? And so we harden our hearts through cynicism and negativity. Maybe we've hardened our hearts through bad experiences based on human failures. Human failures. I've known people who said, oh, I'll never go to church again. Why? Well, because I went to church one time and they did this, this, and this. And I said, well, then that was, I said, you, that, wasn't the, that wasn't God that failed you. I said, you were placing your faith in people instead of God. People will always fail you. Amen. Guys, this church is going to screw up. This church is going to forget something. This church is going to is going to mess up because it's filled with human people that have human faults and we make human mistakes. And if you're basing everything about everything you believe about God based on God's people, then you're putting your faith in the wrong thing. God is perfect. God is the the, the Father of love and of truth. And we'll, the rest of us are doing the best we can, but we're going to make mistakes. You can't let that harden your heart. I remember uh, my dad, he, he tells a story. He said he'll, he'll, he'll never eat a jack-in-the-box again. <laughs> uh, he, he, ate, he, had a, he went to jack-in-the-box one time, and we're talking six, <clears throat> 16 years ago. We're talking nearly 20 years ago. He went to a jack-in-the-box, and he didn't like it, and he got sick on it. And so he's never been to a jack-in-the-box ever again. <laughs> right? You know, it's like, if you, did, if you did that with every place, I mean, there'd, be, there'd be no place. I would, like, you know, that's like, I've, been to, I've been to all these places. I've been disappointed. But, you know, I've been to Taco Bell, and sometimes you get a great taco. Sometimes you get one where all the meat is over here, and all the cr sour cream is over here, and there's two pieces of tomato, and they're in the middle. And you're like, have you ever made a taco before? You're not know the way it's supposed to look. You know, it's, it's all the same ingredients, right? It's just put it together in the right way. That's all I'm asking, right? But human people will fail you, and, and we, we let our hearts get hardened because we had a bad experience one time. Guys, we need to be willing to go back. We need to go, will, be willing to say, okay, God, yeah, I have this thing, and I, I need your help to heal from it, but I want to leave my heart open to let you speak to me again. I'm going to let that person have another chance, or I'm going to let that church have another chance, because we understand that, that we have to have an openness to God. So he asks, he asks the disciples, he says, are your hearts too hardened? Have you decided not to let this stuff in? He goes on to ask him another question. He says, he says don't you have ears? Um, let me, let's see if I can find it. Oh, jeez, I've got to put these. <laughs> oh, I hate these things. Don't you have eyes? I know, that's what I'm looking for. All right, verse 18. You have eyes, and they don't work. Uh, you have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? In other words, he's asking them a question of, uh, uh, isn't there evidence? Haven't you seen the evidence? He says, haven't you seen what has happened? You see, too many of us think that we have to have the personal experience. I remember one time I told my dad, and my dad will never let me live this down. No, right? He brings it up all the time. He tells a story. When I was 17, I told, I told him, I said, Dad, you need to understand. I need to make the mistakes for myself in order to learn from them. So you've got to let me make mistakes. And my dad looked at me and he said, Son, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> he said, if you can't learn from the mistakes of others, he said, then that shows a lack of intelligence on your part. Why do you have to go through the same pain? You know, it's like you see someone walk up to something and they touch it and they go, ah, that's hot. And they burn their hand and you look at it and go, is it really hot? And <laughs> you have to touch it too. He said, that's dumb. Learn from their mistake. Right? And Jesus is asking, he's saying, listen, how, you have eyes, have you not seen? You have ears, have you not heard? Can't you see the evidence in front of you? Have I not proven myself to you yet? You see, he says, you can see the change in other people's lives. Guys, you, got, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. You can see God working in the lives of other people. You can see, even through their mistakes and through their failures, through the times where they've fallen down, you can see how God lifts them back up. Shouldn't that mean something for you? 
Shouldn't that give you a little bit more confidence when you find yourself identifying with their, their current issue or their current problem? He says, you have ears, can't you hear? Haven't you heard the stories? Guys, do you know there's a, the reason for all the stories in here? The reason why the, book, the revelation of God doesn't read like a how-to manual? The reason it's not just all about the, the technicalities of this is what you should do and shouldn't do. The reason we have the stories of the people of the, of the, of the ancient world, their failures and their successes, is so that we can learn from them. That's why God included all of that. He said, listen, you know, otherwise, it, you know, if this were written by man, it would probably be written a whole lot differently. It would probably be showing us all the heroes and, and all the good things they did. But the Bible is full of all the failures and all the, all the character flaws and all, all the bad things as well. Because God's saying, listen, I want you to learn from their mistake. Do you need to go and make the same poor choices? Have you not heard the stories? Have you not heard the stories of the people in modern day? Guys, there's a reason why we stand up and testify. There's a reason why we, why we share our stories with, with one another so that we can inspire, so that we can build up and lift up. I had someone share a story with me just this week that was very, very hard for them to share. It was a very painful experience in their life. And the reason they shared is they said, because, because I want others to see that there's hope. <laughs> I want others to see when they're, when they're in the same situation that God can bring you out of it. I am evidence of that. Amen. You see, Jesus says, can't you see the evidence? Can't you see what, what the things that I've done? He goes on to say, he says, don't you remember? Don't you remember? They ask questions of logistics. He says, don't you remember when I fed the 5,000? How many baskets were left over? Well, right? He says, don't you remember when I fed the 4,000? How many baskets were left over? Seven. Seven, right? This is, this is a question of logistics. This is Jesus saying, just, okay, maybe you just don't, maybe you just don't believe that I'm capable. Is that what it is? Do you, you just don't think I'm capable? Let me, let me bring back the evidence to you. Let's, let's bring back the, the occasion. Uh, we fed 5,000 men plus all their women and children, and I had a small boy's lunch, and in my hands it got divided, right? It got divided and kept getting divided, kept getting divided, kept getting divided. I would have loved to have seen that, right? Imagine a guy has a Pop-Tart, and he breaks it in half, and gives you half of it, and then breaks it in half, and gives you half of it, and then breaks it in half, and gives him half of it, and then breaks it in half. I, man, I, my eyes would be glued on the Pop-Tart. <laughs> What's happening? I don't understand. He only has one Pop-Tart. Right? And that's what kept happening. He kept, get, kept giving more of it. Where is the miracle taking place? Or, or maybe it was in the hands of the disciples as they were handing it out to the people. Because I guarantee the disciples couldn't carry a whole lot by themselves, and yet they're handing it out to all these people. Where is the miracle taking place? It, it, it doesn't really matter except that Jesus says, listen, you're, you're, are you questioning whether or not I'm capable? You've got one loaf of bread. There's only 12 of you. I just took five and fed 5,000. I just took seven and fed 4,000. Have I not yet proven myself to you? Don't you remember what I've already done? Guys, we need to be reminded, even in our own lives, don't you remember the things that God has done for you? My mom and I were talking about how we hate the fact that we were of the, of the Harris family for some reason. Um, if you can talk and cry at the same time, we hate you. <laughs> we just decided. Amen. Um, I, 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 when I, when I get emotional, if I, my throat closes off, so I'm going to try to. Sit, I'm going to, and it's going to take me a minute. So just give me, a, give me a minute. My father's in the hospital. Um, he's walking around with a with 95% blockage in the artery that's called the widow maker. Because it's the thing that doesn't give you any warning, you just drop dead one day. That fills me with all kinds of fear. Trepidation. And even anger. Sometimes I'm angry at God, like, really? Him? Has he not served you enough? You're like, but anyway. And then I'm reminded. I'm reminded, so now old are you? You're 17? 
about to turn 17. 17 years ago, I went in for a shoulder reconstruction. I, I dislocated my shoulders 37 times between the two of them. Had this one so bad. If I was wearing tight jeans and I put my hand in my pocket, when I go to pull my hand out, I'd dislocate my shoulder. I'd leave my arm and my, I'd have to do this. They said, they said there's so much damage. Everything is torn, your tendons are gone, your muscle connections are starting to tear. I couldn't even raise my arm up any higher than this. They said, we're going to go in and we're going to do an open repair. We're going to do power surgery. We're going to have to rebuild everything you've got. And in the pre-op room, I was worried. And uh, it was strange. And, and my dad was there with me. And he said, he said son, uh, he said, what's going on? He said, you've had surgeries before. You had your left shoulder rebuilt. You've had your knee rebuilt. All the stuff he said, he said, well, what's, what's different about this one? I said, Dad, I don't know, but I don't think I'm coming back from this one. And he says, well, let's pray. And then he prayed a bold prayer of healing. And it was one of those where I, I kind of opened my eye and looked at him like, you okay? Like, and it was a bold prayer of healing. When he was done, I looked at him, I said, do you pray over your people all the time like that? I said, because you got, you got a lot of disappointed people if that, if that, if that doesn't happen. And he said, he said, I prayed as I felt led to. Went into this for the surgery, four and a half hour surgery. Surgery lasted 27 minutes. Doctors came out and he talked to my father and my wife who were waiting in the waiting room. And they, said, they said, he said, I don't understand what has happened. He said, I've never seen anything like it. He said, we went in with the scopes first just to see where all the damage was and everything before we really opened them up. And he said, we could not find any damage in his shoulder. He said, well, I've never had an x-ray. I've never had an MRI. I've never had all those tests lie to me before. He thought it was a failure in equipment and all this other stuff. And he said, but it's a good thing that we didn't keep Keith under for the four and a half hours, he said, because there's something... He's having some kind of adverse reaction. He's in recovery right now, but we can't get him to breathe on his own. He said the anesthesia, for some reason, was damaging the part of his brain that does all that stuff for you. And he said, and I truly believe if we had kept him under for four and a half hours, we would have lost him. Hallelujah. Quite frankly, I don't care if you believe my story or not. I know it to be true. I experienced all of that. I saw all of that and I walked away from it. Being miraculously healed. So when I think about my dad in the hospital, I hear the voice of Jesus saying, Have I not proven myself to you yet? Do you not think me capable? Are you really questioning whether or not I could snatch him out of there and miraculously heal him? Have I not earned your faith yet? So that's when, when I feel those, those feelings, those human emotions of fear and anger and, and trepidation and all this other stuff. It's my mind that says, all right, Get thee behind me, Satan. My God's bigger. My God walks on water. My God heals the sick. My God feeds the thousands. My God can take care of this. My God is so much bigger. And my God is sovereign too. And if my God says it's time for my father to go home, then it's time he's saving him from something else. And, and Lord, your will be done. But I have no right to question him anymore. I have no right to wonder whether or not he can or is willing to. Because my God has proven himself to me. See, it's a question of faith. His last question there is, do you <clears throat> understand yet? In other words, do you have faith? How much more will it take? How much more will it take? 
You've seen me work. You've heard the stories of the scriptures. You've seen me work. You've heard the stories of the, of the modern day. Here today, you've heard stories of healing. You've heard stories. You, you, you've all heard stories from people of how God has, has moved in, in people's lives. You've seen people's lives change. You've seen your, your son who's been addicted. To, sorry, I, I just looked at the roads and I thought, I thought of Ross and Morgan and I thought, oh my gosh, what a difference we've seen in their life, right? How much more, how much more is it going to take? How much more until you will fully put your faith and trust in Him? What's He got to do? I brought a muffin I'd like all of us to eat this morning. We're going to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes that's the way people are, right? People say, well, if you'll just do this one more thing. If you'll just do this one more thing. I want to take you back a couple verses. Verse 11, it's not going to be up on the screen. I'm, 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 I'm going, going rogue here. Verse 11, when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had arrived, they came and started to argue with him. Testing him, they demanded that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. When he heard this, he sighed deeply in his spirit. Imagine that, Jesus. <sighs> What does he say? What do these people? Why do these people keep demanding a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, I will not give this generation any such sign. If you're here today and you've not given your life fully over to Christ, if you've not placed your trust and faith in Him, and if you're making the mistake of saying, "God, just show me one more thing," you need to understand at some point Jesus is gonna. <sighs> nope. I'm not going to make that miraculous change in your life. I'm not going to give you that miraculous provision. I'm not going to do this. Because why? Because I've already given you the scriptures. I've already given you the testimony of everybody around you. I've already given you a church. I've already given you friends. I've already given you all this stuff. And if you won't do it now, then maybe you never will. Guys, if you're here this morning, I'm only going to ask you one more time. What will it take for you to place your faith in Jesus Christ. Would you bow for me? Bow me for a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I thank you. Lord, I trust you. As that father once said to you, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Lord, I'm sorry for the fear. I'm sorry for the anger. I'm sorry for the doubt. God, I give it to you. Take it from me. For I believe, I trust, I believe in who you are, I believe in the words that you've said, I trust in your love, in your provision, in your sovereignty. And God, I submit to your authority. You know better, you know best. Lord, I give you all control in my life. I have no more reason to doubt. I have nothing to fear. And I have no right to be angry. here that's struggling. Don't give up on him just yet. <clears throat> Terry, just a little while longer. Knock on their heart's door just one more time. Lord, we don't ask for a miraculous sign. 
We don't ask you to prove yet again who you are. But Lord, we ask you to just give us one more chance. Just tarry. One moment. In your holy name I pray. Amen. I ask you to stand where you sing this song. Thank you. God's working on your heart. <clears throat> what are you waiting for? Don't wait anymore. You come to sing to
is called King of My Heart. And it's a really nice concept. But it's a good check for us to ask ourselves, who really is the king of our heart? Anyone dealt with sickness in their heart lately? Resentment? Fear? Anger? Anybody in the last week dealt with any of those sicknesses of our heart? Let's ask him this morning to be the king of our heart. Some announcements coming up. I'm just going to go in order with these. Uh, the women's Bible study is 
beginning this Tuesday. Um, so if you'd like, if you'd like to be a part of that, you can still sign up for that. Um, I believe there's a book that goes with that. Thank you very much. So yeah, but even if you don't have the book that first week, please show up. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll cover you. Um, make sure that you have what you need. So the women's Bible study starts on Tuesday. There's still a men's Bible study on Tuesday night as well, but I know they're on a different study. Um, hopefully they're not doing a Beth Moore one. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, three plus one uh, sign up is still available. Um, we're going to draw uh, during uh, this week. We're going to draw names, put people in groups that way uh, through the month, the months of October, November, December, and January. We know that December gets a little crazy, so we're giving you four months to meet together. What is if you don't know, if you'd like to be a part of it, it, it is three families from the, the church getting together and fellowshipping together. Um, uh, uh, three times over the next four months, right? Mm -hmm. So honestly, it's a great way to, to develop new friendships, new relationships uh, in the church and, and get to know people a little better. And it might, we also, we, we draw across services. So if you're always in this service, did you know there's two other services? There's like two other whole churches that meet here that, that work, they're part of the same body and you can get to know them a little, a little better. Uh, so uh, sign up for 3 plus 1 if you haven't done that already. All right, uh, join us for Trunk or Treat. Uh, Trunk or Treat is um, a safe alternative to going door to door on Halloween. It gives the, it gives the kids an opportunity to come down. Um, they can get all the candy they need in one place, and, and they can also get the gospel shared with them, and, and we can have a lot of fun supporting our community. So uh, if you have not signed up for that, you can sign up on our registration page. It's available on our website. Um, Decorate your, your car, uh, your trunk, and be willing to come in some kind of funky costume or whatever and, and be willing to hand out some candy and some and to share some love uh, with with the folks. In the, <laughs> not, the Monster Mash. No, no, no. Not, not the Monster Mash. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a building update. Um, Kim is missing. So I'll just have to tell you, I, I went over there the other day, and we have a building team that's here. Uh, they're, uh, when I went over there, they were building the stairwells. So here in a little bit, you'll be able to go over there and see the bottom floor and go up to the top floor because they're putting the stairwells in. And, uh, any other update on that? I know they're building the stairwells. They're almost done with those, right? Stairwells, stairwells are complete. They're gorgeous. They're complete. These guys have done an amazing job out there. Um, they have one more work day on Monday, and they're going to put up some walls and stuff for us. So we got some more walls up and everything. Okay. Um, but yeah, they're going to, in fact, they just, just barely walked in. So nice. if you see them, thank them. Yes. Um, a great bunch of guys. Anybody here that's been out there and talked to them, and I know a lot of the ladies have been here for lunch and stuff, and I just, my hat's off to the ladies of this church. Mm -hmm. They them, yeah. yeah. Take care of them. They're saying that we really wanted to come to work, and we spent more time eating. <laughs> but they show up every time, don't they? <laughs> so, yeah, just, uh, um, yeah, shake their hands. Um, they're a great bunch of guys. Yep, yeah, show them some love, absolutely. Yeah. All right, um, stand with me, and let's say a word of prayer, and we will be dismissed. Are we early? Well, we, we, we better like not do this. We better not make it happen out of this. People are going to get an expectation. That's okay. I'll, I'll, I can go through the monster match real quick. <laughs> it's a brain. I could probably pray for 15 minutes. <laughs> Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for meeting us in this place. And Lord, for the way that you love us, care for us. And Lord, the way that you provide for us, including our, our church family. Lord, I, I want to thank you for this church family and the way they love on each other and on on those that are in need, those that, that need a, a helping hand, a, a meal, um, a prayer, um, a word of encouragement. Lord, I thank you for designing the church as you did, and, and Lord, for providing this one. Um, we, just, we, th we lift you up, we thank you, and we praise you. We ask that you be with us this week as we go forward, as we um, look at some decisions that need to be made in our personal lives, in our church life, and and all the things that, that we're faced with, Lord, we just, we trust in you. We place our faith wholly in you. In your name I pray.